What's up, metalheads? Welcome to the Scrap Metal Podcast, the show for the misfits who've been listening to the same music since high school. I'm your host, John Von Frankenstein, and joining me today is my metal thrashing mad co-host, Chris. Chris, I gotta ask you, man, how you feeling? I gotta say, I'm feeling like a loser. Like a loser. I'm a loser, baby. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you kill me? Chris, does this feeling of loserdom have anything to do with how you're keeping your heavy metal street cred? You know, it might have something with my heavy metal street cred, or maybe even uh, looking back on my past street cred. So when I was in high school, I was introduced to this band called Losers Sometimes Win. And okay. they were a local hardcore band. I used to do a radio show with another DJ who was starting to get involved. I hesitate to say involved, but he was going to shows with some of the local Long Island (laughs) hardcore bands. And one of these bands was Losers Sometimes Win. And so he became a fan of them. We're playing them on the radio. I think some of the guys actually came to the high school radio station. We interviewed them, had them on air. It was cool for them to hear their music on the radio. Yeah. And it was cool for us as high school kids to have these, you know, local bands coming on because, like, to us, they're kind of sort of local celebrities. You know, they're bands, they're playing these shows, they have a following. You know, I still have their album and will occasionally listen to it when I put a CD on. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it was it was cool to have that. And just a couple days ago, I get a message from my brother sending me an Instagram post. We had just unfortunately missed it, but... Losers Sometimes Win has reunited and had played a show (laughs) on Long Island just the day before my brother sent me this post. So unfortunately, I missed it, but it's cool to see that, you know, (laughs) they're they're reunited and they're back together. I think I actually still have a Losers Sometimes Win poster hanging on my wall somewhere that's advertising (laughs) their album that came out in November of 2005. But, you know, it's, it's, it's cool to see that these... This local band that I was listening to 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah, it hurts. It hurts to say that. <laughs> it hurts to say that once you start dating yourself. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's rough. But it's cool to see that they're back. It's cool to see that people online are excited that they're back. So, yeah, I guess that's why I'm feeling like a loser. I missed out on the reunion <laughs> show of Losers Sometimes Win. It's all right, Chris. We'll we'll have like a little uh, Losers Sometimes Win listening party to make you feel a little bit better about it. <laughs> That's awesome, though. Like, I love when there are bands from your, like, teenage years, you know, those formative years that, like, get back together, and now there's the excitement of, like, oh, shit, now I have the opportunity to see them. And the fact that they were a local Long Island band and, and that you had that interaction with them back then, like... I feel like we can kind of discount sometimes what it means to a band to be able to interact with people that are actually listening to them, especially if they're a local band, right? So even though it was like, I'm assuming they must have been, what, in like their 20s or or 30s or something while they were playing at the time? Yeah, I assume so. It's, I mean, I was 17 years old. Everyone looked old to me. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, I, I can only imagine that they were like, holy shit, we did like a fucking, you know, radio interview. Yeah. That's got to feel that's got to feel really fucking good for them. That is awesome, though. I love that you were able to revisit a little bit of that uh, that high school self, that high school Chris. (laughs) And funny enough, I have been doing a similar sort of uh, walk down memory lane, if you will, listening to a lot of the metalcore bands that I used to listen to back in my high school days and metalcore nowadays, kind of in the same way that butt rock quote unquote, and like (laughs) Christian metal, which we discussed recently, has been getting like a revival. It's also a genre that's like very, very maligned. People do not like metalcore. It still has its defenders. I still count myself as one of them. But (laughs) it's definitely a style of music that has like fallen a bit out of favor as we've gotten uh, like more and more extreme. You're seeing bands more along the lines of like Lorna Shore coming out now than you do a lot of metalcore bands. And whenever you hear the term metalcore, it just feels like a cool little throwback. So that's what we're going to be discussing today. We're going to be doing a not quite deep dive, but a dive into the genre of metalcore, kind of discussing what it is, the different branches of metalcore and the metalcore family, and how this style of music has lasted till today. Chris, I know that you're very hesitant about doing this episode. (laughs) 
I struggle to ask if you're excited. <laughs> it's... No, I'm not excited. But <laughs> is but this I, like the goth deep dive episode that we did for you? So because I, I know you went into that episode kind of feeling like, okay, I, I I hope I find something that I enjoy in this. Did you feel the same thing with this metalcore episode? Not really, no. Um, <laughs> so I took a different approach to uh, this episode. You know, we've done episodes on new metal, which between the two of us, you are clearly the bigger new metal fan. Right. Um, I enjoy a couple songs. I enjoy a couple of those bands. So any new metal episodes, there's something for me to talk about. Right. Like you mentioned with our goth deep dive, I went in hoping I would find something because I really right. didn't know a lot about goth music. And unfortunately, I didn't find anything that I liked. <laughs> With Metalcore, I already know I don't like this music. Okay. <laughs> so instead of just coming up with a lot of creative ways to say I think this music sucks, <laughs> I figured I would listen to it and see if I can figure out, well, why don't I like this music? Because honestly, some of the essential qualities of Metalcore are the qualities of other styles of music that I love. So yeah. what is it about metalcore that I just don't like? And so I guess in that way, I'm excited to have this discussion. All um, right. But I wasn't excited to sit down and listen to a metalcore playlist on Spotify. <laughs> <laughs> I love doing episodes like this with you, though, because I, yeah, I... Whenever we're doing an episode like this, it's me being very, very enthusiastic <laughs> about the style of music that we're discussing. And... You are at least keeping an open mind and finding a way to discuss something about the genre. So I'm glad that like we're not always just agreeing. And when we do disagree, <laughs> that you've gotten past the point in life where you're like, John, I don't have the time or the crayons to explain to you why I dislike this music. <laughs> but for the uninitiated, if you will, let's explain what Metalcore is. So Wikipedia... <laughs> defines metalcore as <laughs> metalcore is a fusion genre combining elements of extreme metal and hardcore punk that originated in the late 1980s. So the way that I have always thought of metalcore was the bands that were influenced by a lot of the Swedish melodic death metal stuff. Bands like At The Gates and In Flames. Those were the bands that stuck out to me right away because that is what I think of as the sound of metalcore, was taking those influences and then Americanizing it and throwing in those hardcore elements, throwing in the breakdowns, throwing in the chug riffs. But there are a lot of American influences within hardcore that led to that as well. Some of the bands that had basically created that, I guess what's called the, the Gothenburg sound, were in flames at the gates carcass as well was it was a big influence at that time and they had like this down tuned kind of buzz saw distortion type of sound and what people always call like the metalcore riff the five seven eight riff <laughs> It's 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 that metalcore riff where like you can hear that being played and you just know it's a metalcore song. Like with the pedaling E in the bottom, yeah. basically like Unholy Confessions by uh, Avenged Sevenfold. Yes. That's the metalcore riff. And In Flames and At the Gates especially were so heavily involved in nurturing that sound and creating that sound because these were bands that came from more straight ahead, like Swedish black metal and then started to ease their way into adapting more melody and, and harmony within the music. You know, what I love about it is that it has this edge to it, but it's still very, very pretty. And that's probably the element that maybe you don't like so much about metalcore. I would imagine. <laughs> I, I mean, I know that you've heard me bring up uh, In Flames before, but have you listened to At The Gates at all? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, know, I know we've talked about In Flames. I, I feel like I've heard of At The Gates, so I'm sure at some point I listened to it and clearly it didn't leave much of an impression. <laughs> um, but, you know, you, you brought up something that I think is 
a big part of what I don't like about metalcore. And the way I would put it is that some of these metalcore bands, the more I listen to it, the more I'm like, okay, maybe this doesn't apply to every single metalcore band. But the right, most right, right. metalcore, the most popular metalcore bands and metalcore songs, it felt like it was all bark and no bite. <laughs> okay. It was all of the elements of heavy music with distorted guitars and and mm-hmm. you know harsh vocals but something about it didn't feel as aggressive as the thrash metal that I usually like to listen to or even some of the punk right. rock that I like to listen to and I think some of it is that it's trying to sound pretty in I don't want to say a commercial way mm-hmm. but in a more accessible way yeah it, yeah it's, i could agree with that it's it has the distorted guitars but it sounds just pretty enough that people that want to listen to heavier music without listening to music that makes them feel bad can listen to <laughs> you know it's i i don't know enough about it to confidently say one way or the other but it feels very much like playing something in a major key versus a minor key so, I mean, sometimes it's, you yeah, know, it has some of that. Yeah. Some of that harmonic leaning is more towards the major side. Yeah, and for sure. I think some of the metal that I like and even some of the punk rock that I like is a little bit more dissonant and mm-hmm. a little bit more uncomfortable, I guess you could say, right. than some of this metal core. Yeah. There's a little bit more tension being built up in that music than than there is with some metal core where with yeah. those pedal riffs and like with the type of songwriting that they're doing, it is all presented in a very pretty way. And that's like, for me, it's never been a bad thing because I, I love in flames. I love, especially when we're talking about in flames, it's the early albums that really influenced a lot of the metal core. Like if you put on Clayman or Horacle or colony, those are the albums that influenced a lot of the like, metalcore bands that were coming out in the 2000s same thing with at the gates like you look at the album cover right and it's just uh like uh, the album cover for slaughter of the soul and it it looks like it's just depicting this apocalypse it's like all red and orange (laughs) and then you listen to the riffs and they're heavy they're hard hitting but there is that prettiness to it and that's just something that I've always really liked. Same goes for Carcass. Heart, the Heartwork album is like insane, but there's this weird element of prettiness to it that I really like. And then you wouldn't have metal core without the hardcore influences. Yep. So bands, especially, especially bands like Earth Crisis, because Earth Crisis was probably one of the first hardcore bands to be incredibly well produced at the time especially like considering the their peers the music that was coming out at the time a lot of it is DIY stuff a lot of it you can tell that it's a little bit more raw and it has like that kind of cred to it right but the Firestorm EP was so well produced and had those like basic open E chug riffs that sounded so good that's in every metalcore breakdown is the firestorm like beat down riff pretty much <laughs> but you had bands like earth crisis you had bands like marauder as well who were using the metal influences and bringing it more into hardcore and adding some legitimacy to it because especially back then a lot of the hardcore bands didn't want to have a metal influence and since doing our hardcore episode, I've listened to so much more hardcore and you you can see how much of the roots of punk are being pulled through a lot more than I really realized, you know, in, in earlier years listening to hardcore. And so to, to I, I can only imagine it must have been like listening to Metallica and hearing the acoustic guitars come out like to have a riff that sounded a little bit more metal than your standard hardcore riff at the time, like youth of today and Marauder sound very different. So I I could imagine that there was definitely some pushback from people in the hardcore community. Once those metal influences started coming in and that's like the, just the very beginnings of it. Yeah. Cause I, I think, I think it came up when we did our hardcore deep dive and 
as we've discussed, we as music fans love to gatekeep and, <laughs> you know. Part of what we do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, no big deal. If fans of a style of music like hardcore are like, no, these are the the rules of being a hardcore band. <laughs> and all of a yeah. sudden someone tries to come yeah. in and say like, well, no, I want to play something that sounds a little bit more metal. I want to use these metal yeah. influences. I'm not going to play strictly hardcore punk. I'm going to bring in some heavy metal influence. Hardcore, hardcore fans are not going to like that. You know, they're gonna, they're gonna hardcore, hardcore. Yes, fans. Yeah. <laughs> they're they're gonna, they're not going to like it. And like you mentioned, you know, Metallica with its acoustic guitars, Kill 'Em All comes out, and it's all of Dave Mustaine's best thrash metal riffs, and people fall in love with that version of Metallica. Then Ride the Lightning comes out, and the first thing you hear when you drop the needle is an acoustic guitar. And fans were like, what the fuck? They sold out. They're playing fucking acoustic guitars. Yeah. Where's the metal? Never mind the fact that Fight Fire with Fire is one of the greatest thrash metal songs ever written. But because it starts with acoustic guitars and because you have, you know, a song like Fade to Black on that same album, which is a ballad, you're going to have those gatekeepy fans that are like, no, this is too far of a deviation of what this specific genre entails. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, I can see how a hardcore band that is pulling influences from not just New York hardcore and hardcore punk, but also from metal bands of the time or from before them, fans of hardcore are not going to like that. I, I love that point because it was up to bands within the scene to like to make it okay to do that to make it okay to bring in metal influences bands like sick of it all who are like staples of the hardcore scene you know and their their earlier albums definitely have more of that that hardcore punk influence but you start to hear more and more of the metal coming in um chromags chromags yeah. as well agnostic front where a lot of a lot of the sound started injecting more and more metal, and I think it was because these guys were also cross pollinating with the thrash acts of the time. I'm sure that they were listening to thrash just like everybody else was, and they wanted to start emulating that. Like maybe they saw the intersection where it was all like coming together for them, and they realized like, oh, okay, we don't necessarily have to be something that's so separate. But as time went on, and you had the factions of metalcore really starting to form i feel like there are three important camps of metalcore that we can discuss so first you've got the metal bands that were using hardcore beatdowns and like the more like straight ahead kind of beatdown riffs you had the gang vocals coming in um and you had like more of those hardcore riffs of like that that hardcore punk yeah. type of riff that you would maybe have for reverse or something like that then you had, like we just discussed, the hardcore bands that were injecting a lot of the elements from thrash and metal into their sound and using the pedal tones like you had with the melodic, uh, Swedish melodic death metal um, to make the sound a little bit heavier. And then you've got, like, this is my least favorite of the three. <laughs> <laughs> and probably Chris's as well. But then you had the hardcore bands that were, like, on the cusp of being post-hardcore or emo but they had breakdown riffs in them too. And that's like, and, and those pedal riffs, the metalcore riff, but they definitely felt more like they were leaning towards the emo side, which I've, we've discussed it at length. Chris and I are not <laughs> fans of emo music. And so I feel like those were the, the three big camps that you had though. Would you say that that's kind of an accurate assessment or like an accurate filing of the different types of sounds that you heard in listening to that uh, that one playlist that you <laughs> <laughs> managed to make it through? Yeah, definitely, because there were bands on there 
that I feel like were the metalcore bands that seemed the most metal. And yeah, they were playing like a metal riff. And I feel like you mentioned the riff from Unholy Confessions by Avenged Sevenfold. Yeah, yeah. That's a song. I remember seeing the music video for that and thinking that that riff was really cool. The song yeah. gets into <laughs> stuff that I'm not as interested in, but that riff is really cool. And it's, it's a, it's a metal riff. And so I, I had this idea that metalcore were these metal bands doing that sort of thing where it was right. a metal band and then like, oh, we're going to throw in some hardcore breakdowns and, you know, whatever. Yeah. And then you did have hardcore bands because I was I was almost insulted to see Hatebreed show up on this metalcore playlist <laughs> because Hatebreed is a band that definitely came out at the same time as some of these metalcore bands. But yeah. leaned way more into the hardcore, and they were playing yeah. these punk riffs. But every once in a while, you got something that sounded a little bit more metal from Hatebreed. But they were definitely a hardcore band playing metal instead of a metal band playing hardcore. Yeah. And then you did very much have, and they showed up on this playlist as well, those post-hardcore and emo bands that I like threatened to beat up the fans of every day of high school. <laughs> like I just could not stand that music. And it's, you know, the music that I feel like became like screamo and like all that, like I just, yeah. I, I want yeah. no part of that. That is the music that those were the kids that I was at odds with throughout high school. <laughs> you know, the kids that were listening to that music and calling themselves hardcore as like I'm listening to Mad Balls saying, Yeah, this is hardcore and then they're calling themselves hardcore, I'm like, I will punch you in the face. <laughs> <laughs> but like now knowing what I know about how Metalcore came to be, I could I could see how those people were maybe in the hardcore scene and as this like post hardcore sound started to come out and this emo sound started to come out, maybe they were hardcore kids. But now they were fans of bands like Poison the Well and From Autumn to Ashes, who like, I remember hearing the name. I know I saw Poison the Well at some point in my teen years, but I was like, this is good. I I don't know why I don't listen to it more. So I went back and I checked out From Autumn to Ashes and Poison the Well. And most of the stuff is okay as far as Poison the Well goes. But I was like, mm, all right, there, there, there were a couple of breakdowns, but it felt like they were definitely leaning more towards the emo end. And then from Autumn to Ashes, I was like, this is fucking metalcore? You guys consider yeah. this fucking metalcore? That felt very much like if the guys in Brand New just had like a couple protein bars <laughs> and like lifted weights. <laughs> and mind you, I like Brand New. My wife got me into Brand New, so I'm a fan. I, I There's no hate there. But like it just it didn't feel like what I considered to be metalcore. And so that's why I had to have like that last little that last little division where it's like, OK, I can I can see why these guys were included in the list. I could see why someone like Hatebreed would be included in the list, but they are absolutely a band that was playing hardcore and injecting metal into it as opposed to the other way around. You know, like I, I was, I was looking up. I was like, okay, is there anyone else that I can listen to that'll really give me a good idea of what metalcore was before I knew it? And I would see bands like Meshuga was on one list. <laughs> the fuck is that about Meshuga <laughs> metalcore? Lamb of God. Yeah. And the justification was, I even went to our heavy metal intern Russell, and I was like, Russell, give me your true fucking opinion. Is Lamb of God metalcore? And they were like, yeah, of course, because like there's some hardcore elements to that. And I'm like, no, no, they're not. They feel more like modern thrash or like speed metal. And then I realized, like, OK, am I getting too nitpicky about the genre or the sound? But again, they didn't have those key elements that I feel make a metalcore band. Nowhere in Lamb of God's discography can we find the Unholy Confessions riff or some deviate or some deviation yeah. of that. Because with a lot of these bands, you really could. I mean, if you look at a band like, talking about sort of like the the golden era 
of metalcore, right? Like my formative teenage years, like 2000 to like 2007, where metalcore was all the fucking rage yep. before like fucking Attack Attack came out with fucking <laughs> crabcore. <laughs> That's a whole other thing. That's like oh, when boy. when yeah. when the scene kids started getting into metal and you had yep. like more of that shit. But that's a story for another fucking time. <laughs> but like someone like Atreyu, okay? And I'm going to give myself credit here cuz you're going to laugh. Attack Attack is very different from Atreyu. Atreyu is very poppy metal that had some hardcore elements to it. That's why they were like a commercially successful metalcore band. When you listen to, oh, fuck, uh, of course I forget the fucking names and I don't have the list of songs in front of me, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, like Wrong Side of the Bed and whatever that, that fucking album with the vampire chick on the front was, like all of those songs, they were very pretty sounding metalcore songs on the cusp almost of emo or screamo, but I wasn't at the point yet where I was like, okay, no, this is corny. But yeah, someone like Atreyu, who was like super, super commercial. And like, I I know that they kind of fell apart. I think that whoever was the drummer back in the day is now the lead singer and the lead singer left or whatever. But a band like that feels way prettier than someone like Unearth, who I feel like Unearth was a... Again, a hardcore band that was injecting a lot of metal into it, especially like with the solos and things like that that they had going on. They were playing seven strings. I don't know a lot of uh, hardcore bands from back in the day that were playing seven strings. August Burns Red is another band that felt like very, very like commercially pretty and like they just had that sort of sound to it. I don't know how else to describe it, but it was just the bands that like you knew were okay for the girls in high school to listen to. <laughs> and they had a, and they had a lot of female fo- they had a large female following because it was like you said at the top of the episode, it wasn't threatening. It was more easily accessible and it was maybe a lot of people's gateway into heavier bands, but th- I guess like music like that has its place. Right. You you have to like kind of have some bait out there for people to kind of come into the metal world sometimes. Right. Yeah, definitely. You know, as I listened to it and I think even before I started listening to it, I, I realized that similar to goth music is that this is music for this is like babies for subculture. This is, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is the gateway genre of music. This is for when someone hears the heavy guitar and the harsh vocals and they're like, oh my God, this is like th- so heavy and so like metal. Like it's it's all of the things I want out of music. And then someone can be like, well, it gets heavier you know like it's i think a good example is because i remember it in the avenged sevenfold the the music video for unholy confessions pretty sure the lead singer's wearing a metallica t-shirt yeah now i would assume someone listening to avenged sevenfold has maybe heard of metallica but maybe they haven't yeah and if they see him wearing a metallica shirt and they're like well hey my new favorite band listens to this band metallica i'm gonna go check out metallica and yeah. then they become a fan of Metallica. You know, right. it is it is definitely a style of music that for people that go on to discover other styles of music, it's a great gateway genre. I think yeah. some of the times that I would get frustrated was usually when people who listened to metalcore and that was the heaviest music they listened to tried to claim that that was the heaviest music that existed and that there was yeah. nothing more heavier <laughs> and more metal than Atreyu. And it's like, yeah. <laughs> no, no, it gets, and it's, it's interesting to talk about Atreyu because Atreyu was a band that me and, and my friend who was also a DJ in high school targeted a lot because everyone we knew listened to Atreyu. <laughs> And we made fun of Atreyu and talked so much shit about Atreyu. And then something funny happened. The DJ comes in one day and he's like, I'm going to play a song. I was hanging out at someone's house and a cover of uh, You Give Love a Bad Name (laughs) came on. And he's like, I'm not going to tell you who sings it. I'm not going to tell you who did this cover, but I'm going to play it for you. 
and you're going to tell me if you like it or not, and then I'm going to tell you who played it. And he plays the song, <laughs> and it turned out to be a Treyu, who yeah. we'd spent a year talking shit, and then he plays this cover for me. And like, yeah, it's it's a good cover, but like, yeah. that wasn't going to stop me from talking shit about this band, because all the people I knew listened to them and thought that they were like so great and so heavy or whatever it was, but... <laughs> But yeah, I think to back to the original point, it's 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 a style of music that if you want to get into heavy music, it's a good first step because you yeah. don't necessarily want to throw someone into the deep end and be like, oh, you want to listen to heavy music? Here's Mortician. Like, no, <laughs> like it's you build yeah. to that. Let them yeah. let them listen to Avenge Sevenfold. Let them listen to, you know, bands like, um, oh, what else? other bands did we just have listed here that i didn't make a list <laughs> see i made a very specific list that i'm gonna get into later but you know bands that are like from autumn to ashes or, or whatever it is there are bands you can listen to that have some of the elements of heavier music and if you like those elements you go on and find that heavier music because that's what i did yeah. I listen yeah. to punk rock and then I hear Motorhead, I hear Iron Maiden. And then someone is like, well, hey, if you like those bands, I hear Metallica. They're like, if you like Metallica, listen to Anthrax, listen to Slayer. And then yeah. I'm discovering Cannibal Corpse and I get to the point where I'm listening to Mortician. And I'm like, okay, yeah. driving to work, listening to Mortician for my 20 minute drive was a bit intense. <laughs> I'm going to have to listen to something else on the drive back. <laughs> But it's like all the things I said in the goth episode, I would say the same things about metalcore. It's a great gateway style of music if you're interested in hearing heavier music. I don't like it. Right. But right. I'm not going to anymore gatekeep and say, <laughs> oh, you're not cool for listening to that. I've grown up right. a little bit. And so I won't just, do that. Just a bit. Though. Just that little bit. <laughs> See, like, other bands where, I mean, to your point about being a, a gateway band, these bands are still a gateway for me. I, uh, like, up until maybe two or three years ago, I would hear on Earth and be like, yeah, they're a hardcore band. Because that, to me, like, I considered them more hardcore than metalcore. You know, same thing with Hatebreed. I was like, yeah, Hatebreed's a hardcore band. Yeah. And they are. But it's led me to other bands it's yeah. led me to more straight ahead hardcore bands you know um zulu rotting out who i've been listening to like non-fucking stop rotting out is so fucking good and like you know even even the the hardcore bands that are coming out now knocked loose and kubla khan who i'm gonna be seeing in april i can't fucking wait <laughs> um you can hear that they're bringing in a lot of metal influences so like it's still happening but it's it's not divided in the way that it was back in the in the early 2000s. Yeah. You know, you, you can you can see, though, how a band like Unearth would eventually lead me to something like Kublai Khan. Yeah. Where it's like, oh, OK, like I like this. I'm seeking out something that's heavy like that again. And so I'm going to get I'm, I'm going to get there eventually. And I'm glad that like I'm still discovering bands that are that have more elements of like the original genre in them. Like going going back even before you had bands like Shadows Fall and Kill Switch Engage, you had bands like Aftershock and Overcast that had a lot of these same members that went on to form these bands. That was like the New England sort of scene. So like Overcast had uh, Brian Fair from uh, Shadows Fall, the singer of Shadows Fall, and Mike D'Antonio, who's the bass player for Kill Switch Engage, went on to form their own separate bands, both being incredibly successful. Aftershock had Adam D of Kill Switch Engage, and you know a, a few other members. And to to me, out of the two between Overcast and Aftershock, Aftershock blows fucking Overcast out of the water. But <laughs> but I really liked them, and I could see how like. They were definitely both involved in heavier bands than they eventually wound up being in, but they got there because of the older influences. Even a band like Bleeding Through. Bleeding Through, 
I used to laugh at these fucking guys. <laughs> I remember when when they first came. Mind you, the same time I'm listening to Atreyu, I'm like, no, Bleeding Through is corny. But <laughs> I don't know what it was. Like, listening to Bleeding Through, I know that there's a one song that starts out with, like, a, an audio clip from Boondock Saints. It's the scene where Willem Dafoe is in the alleyway, and he's like, and yeah. there was a firefight! And then the fucking song starts, and there's, like, keyboard to it and shit like that, too. And it almost sounded like they wanted to do like Cradle of Filth meets Hardcore. And so I listened to a couple songs off of that album and I was like, all right, this isn't bad. This is okay. But it started to get where the clean vocals would come in. And that's where I was like, oh, I'm checked out. The clean vocals and the keyboard in this. Like when you're not a good clean singer, then it's it's kind of rough. And that's where like you got that was another element of metalcore where you would have like the designated clean singer. It would usually be like the bass player or the drummer or something. It was very rare to have a singer who could do both. Yeah. Um, it Dies Today is another band that I was like, oh, no, this is not for me. This is like a fucking chick metalcore band. That's that's how I was back <laughs> in the day. My buddy Mike and I had seen them open up, I think, for Shadows Fall. And we were such assholes. We were clapping throughout their entire set because every song was the same tempo. And after like the second or third song, when we realized this, we were like, oh, this is going to be good. And we just clapped through the entirety of their set. And the girls, I feel awful. The poor girls in front of us are just there to see their favorite fucking band. And they kept like shooting us fucking daggers the whole time as him and I are like, 180 BPM? Yeah, I think it's 180 BPM. <laughs> <laughs> it's fucking great. But I again, I apologize. If you were one of those four young ladies trying to enjoy their show, I apologize now. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, then you had bands like Shadows Fall and Kill Switch Engage, who were like the golden boys yeah. of the metalcore genre. Anyone who thinks of metalcore eventually thinks of Shadows Fall and Kill Switch Engage. Shadows Fall had a lot more of a thrash influence. Shadows Fall had a lot more of like a speed metal influence, but it was still metalcore. Kill Switch Engage brought in that fucking pretty factor that I yeah. talk about with bands like In Flames and At the Gates. Holy shit. A song like Last Serenade, a song like Voice of the Voiceless, so fucking good. And you had clean vocals in them that sounded great. But when Kill Switch Engage came into their own, was when Howard fucking Jones joined the band. <laughs> because I remember hearing Fixation on the Darkness with Jesse Leach, their original and current singer, when they re-recorded it with Howard Jones when he joined the band. I'm pretty sure that was like his demo for the band. And they were like, this is fucking great. We're releasing it. And they like released a music video with him in it too. And I was like, holy fuck, this guy's voice is so fucking powerful. And uh, Howard had come from Blood Has Been Shed, who was another band that I had discovered recently. I think I found them during our Black History and Metal episode. Go back and listen to that one. And I was just fucking floored by how powerful his voice is. I know Chris, one of your favorite YouTubers, the charismatic <laughs> voice, has done videos on Howard's vocals and just how powerful and how round and warm his voice is. And... For him to be singing a ballad like The End of Heartache and then to just go into like When Darkness Falls and the big fucking scream at the beginning of that is just so fucking incredible. I, I love Kill Switch Engage. Their later <laughs> stuff has sounded kind of the same. Like now that Jesse's back, I, I still really love it, but it's kind of getting somewhat repetitious, to be honest. But goddamn, those first like... Uh, the the first like four or five albums because I always forget that the first one was like an EP uh, with Jesse but yeah yeah I I really loved those fucking albums and Kill Switch Engage was definitely one that I I will defend them Chris I will <laughs> defend them against your attacks <laughs> I will say going through the playlist and you mentioned it and I would a hundred percent agree is that in addition to a band like Avenge Sevenfold. I was expecting to hear Shadows Fall and Kill Switch Engage when I started doing this research on Metalcore because those are the bands that I think of as the Metalcore bands. And right. on this playlist was The End of Heartache, which mm -hmm. is a good song. I did yeah, enjoy baby. listening to it. 
this distance. Yeah, like it's uh, it's it's good, and it's it's not the style of music I usually want to listen to, but it's still really good. I don't think I'd like any other Kill Switch Engage, <laughs> but that song was really good, and I think that song also a little bit exemplified something that we have talked about is in metalcore is like that poppier sound that you'll sometimes get. Yeah. And I would hear it in some of these songs, you know, when you get to the chorus and yeah. it made me think of Brian Posehn, what he referred to as the gay part. <laughs> yep. <laughs> in his uh, metal, metal by, by numbers. numbers. So it's, that's because that's, he's making fun of metalcore in that yeah. song so like calling it the gay part i'm like you get what he's saying that it's a very you go from this thrash metal riff to a hardcore breakdown to the poppiest fucking chorus yeah. ever yeah. and it's it's very dynamic and it has a lot of different things going on so yeah. i can see yeah. how that can be attractive to people because I feel like we've talked about that as well is that it's cool when you have a song that is more dynamic, that has an intro that goes into a different type of verse, that goes into a different type of chorus, you know, right. and, and when a band is able to show range, it is interesting and makes the music more interesting. So, yeah. yes, it is more interesting as a listener to hear this aggressive thrash metal going into a very poppy and not so aggressive chorus. Yeah. But that's not always what fans of heavy music are looking for. Right. And so I think that's part of it for me is that it's, I keep going back to that. It's, it's not aggressive enough or it's not uncomfortable enough or whatever it is because it's i forget which band it was but the lead singer had a scream in the song that reminded me of the way davy havoc will sometimes scream in <laughs> afi songs <laughs> specifically the song affliction off of december underground okay and i listened to the song the original song with the guy screaming i'm like okay I know I like when Davey Havoc screams like this. Right. But I don't like it when this guy does it over this style of music. What's the difference? And like, obviously, AFI. AFI will be called a lot of things. It'll never be called metalcore. You know, it's I'll, <laughs> I'll fight the people that call them emo and everything. It's they're the band that all the emo bands wished they were. <laughs> but I think because AFI... You know, the song Affliction is still very... It's got a very moody and melancholy type of feel. And uh -huh. it's it's got almost like a sad sound to it. And mm -hmm. some of these metalcore songs, they don't always have that sad sound. And I think that's some of what I look for in the music is that I like when it has that aggression, at least if, if it's metal. You know, obviously right. I have no problem listening to some pop songs and I'll listen to pop punk that obviously has a much more upbeat feel. The lyrics are depressing as fuck, but ska is one of the most upbeat <laughs> <laughs> styles of music there is and i really enjoy third wave ska so i'm not above listening to styles of music that have a more positive feel but i think it's when i'm listening to the distorted guitars and the harsh vocals i expect the distorted guitars and harsh vocals to emphasize the aggression not yeah almost mask the fact that there's no aggression okay okay so it's the context in which the the vocals are found and and the harshness is found where it's like don't sing me this ballad about your love sing to me about smashing someone's head in if you're going to be playing with these <laughs> i mean it's it's not <laughs> even that guitars. it's not even that context i think it's just again the the sound of the riff cuz like we're saying that the the riff to unholy confessions is a good riff <laughs> yeah but there's something about it to my ears that just does not sound nearly as aggressive as the other metal that I want to listen to. Yeah, yeah. It's it's like intentionally pulled back. Atreyu was guilty of the same fucking thing too. Atreyu's first album, the guitar tones on that just sound like it was just run through an overdrive pedal, but they were playing metal riffs. So it's it sounds wrong. It sounds like they wanted to be an emo band, 
but discovered how to play that metalcore riff and we're like oh we could we could fucking do this throw a breakdown in but like you it's it's not distorted it's overdriven yeah. so you get a little bit of the clean guitar still kind of coming through it's very odd like if if you're not a, a guitarist to really pick out what what we're talking about but it's like intentionally turning down the fuzz on the guitar or the grit on the guitar yeah and i remember being so angry at Atreyu for a couple songs where I'm like, if you just turn the fucking gain knob up a little <laughs> bit, just a little bit. And that second album, it definitely got better. Or their third album, again, the one with the vampire girl on it. Th- their guitar tone got a little bit better at that point, but not not even. Like, there was still, I think it's called the Remembrance Ballad or like the Leaving Ballad or something like that. And there's like a guitar line that it starts out with and it just sounds so fucking weak and it's because of the guitar tone like i wanted it to have a little bit more of that sustain and a little bit more of that distortion to it so it could sound like a proper lead part but it's just like it's it was a way a fucking limp noodle like <laughs> just yeah like i don't know it's it's really hard to 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 describe but Thankfully, that's why Russell puts these playlists together for us that you guys should check out (laughs) so you can see exactly what we're talking about. Chris, I have loved talking about metalcore with you. (laughs) This has been, this went a lot better than I expected it to. (laughs) But you did have a list of bands that you said you wanted to bring up, so I'm really curious about that. Why don't you go ahead and hit us with that? So here's something that I think I, for whatever reason always associated with metalcore uh-huh. and i think because some of the most some of the most popular metalcore bands especially bands that i saw on this playlist have the four word name <laughs> yeah and okay. so any for so because so many metalcore bands have a four four word name i have like a pavlovian response to any four word name <laughs> band <laughs> that i don't like uh huh. Bands like <laughs> Bring Me the Horizon, The Devil Fuck Wears up. Prada, As I Lay Dying, Bullet for My Valentine, Every Time I Die, Of Mice and Men, We Came as Romans. Now, those are the metalcore bands, but it yeah. goes beyond metalcore. You've got bands like From Autumn to Ashes, which we did mention, A Day to Remember, Story of the Year. Funny story, Story of the Year is the band that I forgot the name of and have a sticker of them on my bass and covered it with a Metallica sticker. Uh, From first to last, Scary Kids, Scaring Kids, Funeral for a Friend, Theory of a Dead Man, Job for a Cowboy. Honestly, there's only a couple four-word name bands that I enjoy. (laughs) Two of those would be System of a Down. And Rage okay. Against the Machine. All right. Most other four-word name bands, I want nothing to do with. And it's because <laughs> so many of those four-word name bands came from metalcore. And I didn't like metalcore. And I thought all metalcore bands had four-word names. And I can't tell any of them apart. <laughs> and so I just have this automatic response. If you're a four-word name band, you're metalcore and I do not like you. <laughs> so you mean bands like uh as i lay dying and <laughs> every time i die <laughs> even a band like it dies today who's who's not uh four four words but it's, it's close it's close it still gives you that pavlovian itch i get it i understand i totally understand that's it, you have that same uh, uh like weird um gag response that i have whenever i see a song title that's way too fucking long (laughs) like all the stupid fucking scene bands that were coming out with you know oh this is the most fun that a girl can have without fucking like fuck off if you're if you're if you have chapters in your song title (laughs) fuck the (laughs) fuck off (laughs) song titles should not be that fucking long it's annoying unless yeah that's that's i'll give you that i'll give you that unless it's man of wars uh Agony and ecstasy, Achilles in eight parts, or whatever it is. Even that, it's, it's, you're fucking, you're fucking pushing it there, man of war. All right, 
Chris, I feel like this metalcore episode went really, really well, all things considered. <laughs> I know it's not your favorite genre of music, but why don't you give us your suggestion for this episode? So my suggestion for this episode, besides not listening to any of the bands we've talked about today, <laughs> my suggestion is to go out and listen to my absolute favorite four-word name band, They Might Be Giants. <laughs> Specifically, their song. Oh, Christ. Their song, <laughs> Your Racist Friend, off of their album Flood from 1990. <laughs> this song is about going to a party and getting mad that your friend has a racist friend there who's saying all sorts of stupid shit. And one of the best lines from the song is at the end of the second verse, he says. He let the contents of the bottle do the thinking. You can't shake the devil's hand and say you're only kidding. And like, I love that. And I seem yeah. to remember seeing recently on like a Reddit or Tumblr post where someone is like, you can't shake the devil's hand and say you're only kidding is way too fucking hard of a line for it to come from a they might be giant <laughs> song. And yet here we are. So my Very suggestion true. is go out, check out They Might Be Giants, and off of their 1990 album Flood, the song Your Racist Friend. <laughs> that racist friend would have a lot to say about this band that I'm going to go ahead and introduce now. <laughs> <laughs> so we didn't really talk about a ton of modern metalcore bands. I, I, I definitely wanted this to be more so like the discussion of the, the genre as a budding genre and kind of like its heyday and where we connected with it, right? Because it's it's about our experience with the music. Yep. But I could not end this episode on Metalcore without suggesting to our listeners that they check out the band Crystal Lake. Not only does the fucking name have a place in my heart because my <laughs> affinity for horror movies, great fucking name, but their album, The Voyages, their re-recorded version of the album from uh, 2020 is phenomenal. This is some great, great A fucking modern metalcore from a band from Japan. So they <laughs> fucking got it. In the same way, in the same way that you had Swedish bands influencing what bands in, you know, New York, uh, Long Island, uh, uh, Massachusetts, you know, New England was, was doing with how they influenced the metalcore movement there we obviously now sent some metalcore influence uh across the pond to japan but this album is fucking great it opens up with a banger of a fucking track fabricated refuge when you throw in a line where are we supposed to fling the rage in over a fucking breakdown yeah that shit will fucking get you going. <laughs> I love that fucking part. But the song that introduced me to Crystal Lake was the song Into the Great Beyond. This is, it feels like a As I Lay Dying song. Chris, I see you there with the four word uh, title. <laughs> it feels like an As I Lay Dying song and it just has this epicness and this prettiness to it. And it really fucking gets me going. So go check out the band Crystal Lake, especially their album, The Voyages. Yeah, as as hard as that fucking line goes, I always laugh thinking like, this doesn't make sense. This doesn't make English sense. <laughs> Where are we supposed to fling the rage? But I'll take it. It's fine. <laughs> Chris, I'm almost tempted to do our outro in a metalcore style and ha just have me growl my entire part and you say it clean. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for tuning into the Scrap Metal Podcast. <laughs> oh, boy. No, I'm not doing that for the rest of the fucking episode. <laughs> Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Scrap Metal Podcast. The time has come for us to pack up our gear, but we'll be here to rock out with you in the next episode. Stay metal, everyone. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>